going live. All right, and we're live here, uh, wardcircuit.com, uh, and our Circuit Breaker, the Extras video live hangout podcast slash video slash trying to stay home and listen to the to the experts. Um, Clayton Davis, editor in chief and owner of awardcircuit.com. Uh, thanks for coming in today, all you readers. We're going to be taking questions and everything from you. But someone snuck in here when I was when I wasn't here. So he's on the right side of the screen. And his name is Todd Lieberman. He's this great, prolific, amazing producer that you might know because uh, he produced an Oscar-nominated film, which he then received an Oscar nomination for producing, The Fighter, uh, in 2010, which resulted in Christian Bale getting his first Academy Award in Supporting Actor and Melissa Leo in Supporting Actress. And Todd's with us today. Hello, Todd. Hey, Clayton. How's it going? Hey, everybody. Yeah. Uh, hunker down, uh, as you shared before we went live, uh, locked up in a, in a home, getting a little bit of cabin fever, but healthy as can be. I was actually feeling a little sick the other day, uh, but I, I'm pretty sure it was a cold. So You can't catch anything this way, right? This is no. I mean, well, we don't know yet. We'll find out what happens, right, as, uh, as we get through it. But, um, but yeah, just uh, first of all, just uh, kind of introduce yourself to, to readers, like, you know, we, we actually, we obviously gave you a great introduction, but you. you know, who, who are you? What, what do you do? And why do you love film? Oh, that's a, that's a multi, multi-pronged question. Um, Todd Lieberman, uh, I've, I've always loved stories. Um, I can go deep here. All right. So I grew up in, in Cleveland, Ohio and grew up in the theater. And ever since I was a young kid, basically six and seven years old, I was doing plays. And I said, writing, directing, acting, producing, kind of theater all the way through. And I always loved movies. Um, and just the idea of stories, the idea of being able to tell a story, watch a story, be a part of a story, um, was always something that gave me um, comfort, frankly, um, that I was able to either go home and watch a movie or read a play or be on a stage. And all those things gave me a sense of, uh, an escape, but kind of a, a mental boost. And okay. for for my life, um, I, I decided at, a, at an early age that whatever that meant, I wanted to be a part of that professionally. And I had no idea what the uh, you know what a producer was or yeah. the difference between a producer, director, writer. Like none of those made any sense to me in the film business. But when I moved to LA, it was just something that I wanted to pursue. So luckily, I learned that. Um, I didn't really have any skill sets other than uh, being able to find other people who were more talented than I was in certain aspects and be able to kind of put them together for a common purpose. And that turns out that that job is kind of what a producer does. Mm -hmm. so here I am and uh, been able to kind of do this for you know 25 years or so, so far. And just being in the business of storytelling is something I'm uh, cherishing, frankly. Yeah, so I, I think you, I think that's a good place to start, and I because uh, a lot of our readers are are younger or aspiring filmmakers or aspiring something in Hollywood. They want to be part of the Hollywood magic, the Hollywood machine. Um, for, from an educational perspective, I think it'll be good to talk about the role of a producer because I think there's a um, a misconception, uh, a misconception that they are, they want to be directors at some point. So there's a lot of directors that serve as producer. So they think it's just like a, a, a extended arm of it. But what what is it that you do in terms of before a filmmaker even gets on those actors or even thought of the scripts are floating around? What what is your role there? Right. Um. So. I have a few different answers to that. One, one is kind of on the practical side. Yeah. And then one is kind of more on the, forgive me here, the kind of the spiritual philosophical side, right? I'll start with the practical. So on the practical side, day to day, I'm out there looking to fall in love with a story so much that I can't not tell it. That's my goal. That I need to find something that I believe will be so I will I will have the passion for to be able to push through and it might take 10 years to do it 
and a lot of these movies do. You'd reference the fighter earlier, and that that really took you know seven or eight years to make from from finding it to releasing it. So the idea of sticking with something for years and years and years, I learned about myself that in order for me to do that, I have to unequivocally be passionate and love it. I just have to love it. So that's my job. I'm out there finding, looking for stories that I love. You're looking to fall in love. I'm looking to fall in love. And I actually said this to my wife not too long ago, which is, you know, we've been together for over 20 years. And you know, there was a moment in time in my life as a single man where I was out there looking for, uh, you know, companion love and, yeah. and kind of energy going out and yeah trying to find the person you fall in love with and i'm, I'm using that energy in the same way with stories uh, not to be um reductive about it but that's kind of what i do i'm reading i'm looking i'm kind of observing i'm looking around and in addition to the stories i'm looking for the people that i want to be telling those stories with like who are the pieces of talent that i admire who are the directors the actors the actresses the the storytellers the writers who i just love their style i love their voice so collectively between finding stories that i want to tell and finding the people that i want to tell them i'm out there just looking for things to kind of put together so that's on the practical side so when you're and i think what obviously film twitter and i say film twitter both as a as a term of endearment and as a annoyance at the same time, but they they uh, they will often say like, "Why can't this type of movie get made? Yeah. Why can't you know this movie about like you know this type of culture be made and things like that?" What what uh, and and looking at some of your your uh, films in your filmography, things that you've uh, worked on, obviously the fighter uh, most recently. Uh, the Aeronauts with Felicity Jones and Eddie Redmayne, and before that, Wonder with Jacob Tremblay. Like, what when you fall in love with those stories, and it's it, with the existence of something like the Blacklist that that exists, and you know, there's all those untapped scripts and things like that. Um, I think there's again another bad perception that producers are in it for the money; they just want to see what's going to make money, and they're saying like only this type of movie makes money. But that isn't the case with you in terms of like, that's not your, because I know you, you know, we've spoken on many occasions. That's not your agenda. What is your agenda when those movies, when you fall in love with them and then they start that process and get Yeah. Um, so it is true that, and that, that there is a perception about producers of figuring out what's the thing that makes money. And, and I, I fight that, perception but i also fight that instinct frankly quite a bit within myself um so there are movies on my imdb page that i did do for the money and i frankly um i i'll let the the, the you know the listeners decide which ones those are I mean, <laughs> but i regret doing some of those films because they weren't fulfilling to me and this is going to sound you know I don't know what it's going to sound, but I, I can possibly get made fun of for these for these thoughts and ideologies. But I genuinely do need to love it. So, like right here, like there's 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 um sorry, oops, I see. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. First of all, I'm I just saw a Boston Red Sox hat. Oh yeah. Oh, you want another story behind that one? Sure. Let's talk yeah. about it. All right. Check this out. <laughs> that hat. Yeah. Is the exact hat that Bill Buckner was wearing when the ball went through his legs in the uh, Mets Red Sox game. Oh. That is the hat. The hat. That's the hat. Anyways, okay. yeah, right. I'm in my home office right now. I've got like, yeah. <laughs> right. so um, yeah, so Wonder back there, you know, that was a movie, uh, you know, my, my business partner, David and I had read the book uh, before okay. anyone had read the book. We got it from uh, a wonderful former agent at UTA named Howie Sanders. And we just fell in love with that book. And, you know, both of us have kids and we read the book and uh, we said, this is, this is going to be impossible to make this movie virtually impossible, but it's a story we need to tell because it has so much value to it. Yeah. I think right now, simultaneously, Raquel Jermil, RJ Palacio, the author for wonder is doing a book reading of the book on Twitter. Oh, um, and it took us years and years and years to figure out how to get that movie made. And um, it was never driven by the fact that, oh, there's there's real money at the end of this. It was driven by the need to tell the story. And I do believe that when 
when there's love and passion behind the story behind a story that's being told the money the the, the the financial rewards will come from the right stories being told i think that if you start from the inside out if you start from the idea of why is a story need to be told why do people need to hear the story then it will it will figure itself out later um the fighter was another example of that i mean it was you know it was it was just a these two these two writers came into my office and kind of told me the story about these two brothers and i'd been looking for i'd been looking for a movie to do about boxing my entire life because the very first movie i ever saw in the movie theater was the champ with ricky okay Schroeder and john voigt and I'm like just that idea of like one person going against another person and then the rocky franchise has always been something i love and that was the was same thing it was like i don't know how we're going to get this movie made but it just it's just a story that we just fell in love with and you know eight years later it gets made and you know does what it does now there, there's successful versions of that wonder and the fighter happen to be successful versions of it yeah. and then there's there there's financially unsuccessful versions of that but to me if they come from the same place if the idea of making the movie is you need to make the movie regardless of what the outcome is financially and that's kind of how i like going into things then the result almost doesn't matter. Um, you know, Stronger is another movie that's back there. Yeah. That was a movie that I, I also, I mean, I just needed to tell that story. I needed to tell the story about Jeff Bowman and kind of this overcoming uh, physical, physical and mental obstacles and um, figuring out, you know, ways through pain. Um, that movie made no money, but I'd make it again in a heartbeat just because the, the, the creative the creative aspirations were achieved and the results I, I felt not dissimilar to the results I felt in wonder, even though the two of those financially were on very different planes. Yeah. Uh, for anyone who wants, who's never seen stronger, it's on Hulu right now and you can stream it and watch it. So you should give it a shot, a fantastic Jake Gyllenhaal performance. And one of my, the great shots of that year, uh, is a scene and this isn't a spoiler alert because i mean because spoiler if you don't really know but the unwrapping of his legs for the first time is like one of the great scenes uh, of that year in the decade quite frankly um all right so let's talk about COVID 19 and its impact on the industry because uh you were busy up until a few days ago so what what has happened there yeah, I was saying to our staff, uh, I don't know, three weeks ago that you know, we've never been busier in the history of our company. We had five productions going. We had something at Netflix, a pilot at ABC, two movies at Disney, and um, a movie at uh, Lionsgate, all, all either going, about to shoot, or in an early, like a, a late stage of, of prep where we had offices open. So yeah. five things going at once, truly at once had, had been something we've never experienced before. And we were frankly talking about how, how are we going to cover all these things? Yeah. Two weeks later, none of them are going. Um, and that's, you know, I'm, I, I'm not, I'm not uh, saying boohoo for me. I mean, that's just the way the industry is. Nothing is filmed right now. So psychologically, I will say it took a toll. It was really challenging to go from the busiest possibility that I've ever had in my entire career to, the least busy I've ever been in my entire career. And though reconciling th those two extremes within the course of two weeks was really tough. Now, you know, as we'd said before, uh, before we went live, in my view, I remain optimistic that, yeah. um, you know, gone for now is not gone forever. So I do believe that, you know, hopefully all, if not most all of these will end up uh, filming again, and there will be an extreme need for content and people still want stories and people will want to consume stories. And as a storyteller and someone who loves stories and is passionate about stories, like I said before, I feel optimistic that the producer's role will remain an integral one. Um, one of these movies I'd mentioned to you before, it was kind of a lifelong promise I'd made to my mother, well, lifelong, 25 years ago promise. I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. And when I left for Los Angeles, for Cleveland, one of the early things that my mom said, well, first she said, A, don't lose the morals that we brought you up with in Cleveland, Ohio. So right. 
I hope I haven't. I don't think I have. I, I think I've remained true to that promise to her. And hold on to that sports franchise as long as possible. <laughs> I, I, say, I say that because one of our one of our writers, Mark Johnson, is in Ohio, yeah. and he lives in Ohio, and we make fun of him quite often. Oh, man. It's, it's, a hard, uh, fran- it's a hard state to be a sports fan. It is. I, I did go to game seven, though, when the Cavs beat the Warriors, and that was one of the highlights. Uh, high yeah. Level. Yeah. So, um, and the other one was if you end up going to Los Angeles and make movies, figure out a way to film one in Cleveland. So it took me 25 years, but I figured it out. And we were about to uh, go into production on a movie in Cleveland with uh, Zach Levine, Cole Sprouse, a movie called Undercover, um, about music and rock and roll. And we had the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, and we were going to film. And you know, got hiatus. So that there was, you know, on the on the on the business side of things, there's the disappointment of what happens when you go from five to zero. But on the emotional side of things, you know, I've got this promise I made to my mom. I said we were going to do it, and then yeah. it goes away. That was that was tough, but it'll come back though. So we're, we're we're optimistic. All right, if you're just joining us again, I'm here with Todd Lieberman, uh, producer, uh, hanging out with you guys, and uh, we have some few things that are coming through our chat which you can submit questions and just general thoughts if you go to the YouTube channel or you can go to the site page, uh, put it in the comment section below and then we can answer it there. Uh, my best friend, uh, Noel and Jen, uh, they, they live in Florida and they came in just saying hello. They, we have an ongoing joke that they call me Fernando. It's, it's a long story I'm not gonna get into. But hello, Jen and Noel, they just came in to say hello. Uh, Jake, uh, Jake K says, hi, Todd. I was wondering the larger impact of COVID-19 on location scouting for films, if that is impacted. And- yeah, I mean, we, we you know, it, because you don't have access to go in really anywhere, um, it's really almost impossible to genuinely location scout. I mean, we had a movie that, um, it was mostly animated um, that we felt like we were going to continue on because we'd figured out a system by which people could work remotely and we can continue. Okay. On. There was a portion of the movie that is still live action okay. and we we're hoping that we can continue scouting. Um, it, it turned, it proved to be too impossible. Um, okay. and so the long-term impact, I, I don't think it will have very much of a long-term impact, but for the immediacy and I, again, you know, I'm not, I'm not a doctor. Um, I'm just listening to and reading what everyone else is reading, you know, whether this goes on for a few weeks or a few months, I think it's going to be really challenging to figure out how to actually make content, um, location scouting or otherwise. We're in the middle right now of consulting with various doctors and uh, organizers on ways to potentially make people feel comfortable to go back to work should restrictions be lifted in various states. Okay. Uh, those are really early conversations. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Thank you, Jake, for your for your question. Um, Nicholas Landry says, "Hi, Todd. When you were filming the fighter, what was it like filming in a place like Lowell?" Oh, hey, Nicholas. Um, well, uh, we you know we, we actually were pretty insistent <clears throat> on filming it in Lowell. Yeah. Um as one does when one goes through kind of a very, you know, budget uh, exercises, there was a push at one point from the financiers to shoot the movie in Canada because we were going to get more value for the dollar. Okay. And we basically said, we're not going to film the movie in Canada. Either we film it in Lowell or we don't film it in all and at all. And, and our feeling was we really wanted to utilize the city as our back lot okay. and take in uh, the culture. And so, so many of the people that, that we, that we used in that movie were locals and kind of the local flavor, the local color, just the feel of it. It's, it's really hard to replicate that. So, um, it was kind of exhilarating filming in Lowell because we were filming with the real people in the place that they lived. And every time yeah. we were on the set, we'd have, you know, 300 people come and join them. So it was kind of a party. <laughs> Um, what was, uh, it like, you know, you're one of the producers and there's many producers on films. Like it's, it's, a, it's not a rarity, but it is rare when there's just one person. There's obviously there, then there's the executive producers and all those type of labels, but what is it like when you're a co-producer with someone else, like a Mark Wahlberg, who, you know, is also in the film. Do you feel 
th there's equal um, discussions in terms of like th directions and things like that. Is are those is it really important to have that collaborative uh, uh, dialogue back and forth? Yeah, absolutely. And Mark in particular is uh, he's got a producer's mind, so he's he's all about figuring it out. And he was, I mean not only a partner, but kind of essential to the process of making that film. As a matter of fact, I'm trying right now to do a movie with Mark and um, I'm hoping it's going to work out <laughs> and hopefully. Can is, is it the oh. other guys too? I need to know if it's the other guys part too. <laughs> it's not the other guys. Part. Not the, okay. <laughs> Never mind. I, I don't care anymore. <laughs> I, I do. Oh my God. Can you get Mark Wahlberg in a, in a comedy again? Like, I'm trying, man. That's what I'm trying to do. He's the, like such a funny guy. He's so man. funny. He is really funny. I just watched um, that Netflix movie that he did, uh, Spencer Confidential. He is hysterical. Yeah, he's a funny, funny guy. Awesome. Um, let's see. Uh, Nicholas Angie, by the way, he said, thank you for answering the question. That's great. As a, as a Massachusetts native, I could tell the authenticity. So he's from Massachusetts. So he probably also very much appreciates your Red Sox hat behind you. Or or not, because it's or, or not. <laughs> through Bill Buckner's legs. Um, but you, yeah. should, you should embrace the hard times. Yeah. I know. I felt like that was a symbol of courage, uh, frankly. Because, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, from Guillermo Anaya Diaz, a question for Todd. Since he produced The Fighter, if he can talk about working with the cast and crew of the film and in a scale of 1 to 10, how much does Amy Adams deserve that Oscar by now? Uh, you don't have to answer that one. That's very diplomatic. I will answer it, though, because I'm a critic and it doesn't matter what I say. I think Amy Adams gives the best performance in the film. I swear I thought she should have won the Oscar for it. doesn't take away from Melissa Lee or anyone else. I just love Amy Adams by natural default yeah. build. <laughs> yeah, she's one of the great. She's one of the great talents of her yeah. uh, generation. Um, so divert, and so versatile, and she she kind of has a little bit of everything. I've worked with her in the Muppets too, and oh, know, yeah, it was like back to back, going from her performance in the Fighter being what that was to her performance in the Muppets being what that was, and kind of two completely ends of the spectrum with yeah. the same, with the same talent. Um, that crew uh, was was exceptional on the Fighter. Um, and the cast was exceptional. You know, David or Russell's style, and I adore David. He's he's a really close friend. It's kind of um, fast and frenetic, and there's not a lot of time to to think. So just the idea of you know go 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 go, I think was uh, was early, was embraced really early on with both the cast and the crew. Um, it, it wasn't kind of a a slow and steady shoot it was it was kind of fast paced um you know quick uh quick takes and and continuing uh dialogue between the actors in the middle of takes so i can i think every everyone embraced that style and it, it was it was frankly a lot of fun cool uh what's what's the movie that did it for you uh as a kid i mean you, you spoke about the champ yeah. uh having an impact on you but like what what are some of those early um films that like you just like just shaped you and then you were like that like that really hooked you and said i gotta do this well i can uh, there's three of them um the okay. champion one right um and then uh Ro Ro this is gonna be a weird one but rocky four i went and saw that movie and was just so i you know going back and i just rewatched it with my kids it's it's how old are your kids by the way uh 15 and 11. okay good age good Two boys um with all due respect to all the filmmakers of rocky four and sylvester stallone who i'm a huge fan of the movie doesn't hold up in the way that it did when i was a kid yeah. but it still elicits the feeling that i got when i was a okay kid, if that makes any sense no it does so, um, do, you, so do you really like creed 2 since it really leans into the whole uh, yeah the it's a guilty pleasure crapped on i i like all of them. and then the one that made me realize that this is something that i wanted to do as a career was the goonies um i remember seeing the goonies in the movie theater and being like wait a second those are kids in and around my age hold on yeah. i'm in the theater i do acting. why can't i do that yeah. And that was the movie, frankly. Um, thank you, Mr. Donner, Mr. Spielberg. And yeah. um, that was the movie that 
basically convinced me that this is a, a career that people could do. I don't know what the career was, but uh, you know, something watching that movie made me realize that movies is a way people can actually make a living. Yeah. Oh, you know, it's it's great that you, excuse me, it's great that you say that because um, I think uh, with producers and people that want to be uh, get into this industry, and I use myself as an example. I wasn't exposed to all different facets of film. I don't come from a family that is of filmmakers that quite frankly get into the philosophy or mindset of film. They like movies, but they like movies in the general sense. And I, I said this to Paul Walter Hauser the other day, they call me a film snob because they, they think I only like foreign movies. There's, there's a perception of a, of a film critic and they, and they think that is what I am. But um how important is it, I think, from an educational perspective for that next generation? So for your 11 and 15 year old, you're you're working in the industry, so they're getting that natural exposure. But those inner city kids like me that don't have like the robust arts program, because quite frankly, that's the first thing people cut when they're saving money. How can some how can we keep that fire alive and then educate them about how to do this without saying to them? You can be the next Denzel because that's not all they can do. There's other things they can do in the film world. Yeah, I mean, there. You know, the 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 beauty of technology right now, to state the obvious, is that most most people have phones and you can kind of make content um, in the way you know you can kind of just make it. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm one of the judges along with uh, Mark Buckland and the Russo brothers on um, Kids Film It Festival. Oh. Okay. Is, um, it's, it's actually born and bred in Cleveland and they have the ceremony at the rock and roll hall of fame. Okay. Uh, and it's basically kids, a kid's film festival. Um, and the proceeds go to the Michael J. Fox, uh, Parkinson foundation. And it, the amount of, uh, talent that I see coming from kids all across the world, uh, colorblind race, blind, it doesn't matter. They're, and it's amazing. And being the judge for this festival gives me an extraordinary amount of uh, joy and, and hope and understanding that, that filmmaking and storytelling is still a massive part of the arts program. Even if it's not part of a program at a school, people still love it. And, and I've, seen, I've seen shorts from kids who come from uh, you know, wealthy backgrounds, and I've seen shorts. Yeah come from kids from impoverished backgrounds and the talent level is kind of indistinguishable. Yeah. It gives me an extraordinary amount of hope. All right. Awesome. Uh, got a few others here. Uh, Nick, Nick Landry, who, who asked the question about Massachusetts, he says Buckner was before his time. Thank God. So, <laughs> uh, Guillermo Naya said, uh, wow. Forgot about the Muppets. Oh, I'll talk about range. Uh, it's about Amy Adams. Yeah. Um, he also asked, thanks for, he says, thanks for answering. Is there a director and or actor or actress you're dying to work with, which is always a uh, very popular question. Who do you want to work with? Um, well, there's so many. Um, I'll tell it, I'll tell you an interesting story. I don't know that I've ever told this story before on, oh. on a, on a, on a cap. Right. Right. Ex exclusive. Let's go. I'm ready. One. Here we go. Yeah. Um, the first job that I ever had in the business um, well, I was I was I worked in publicity for about a year and realized that wasn't for me. Then I worked at a company called Summit. This is bef well well before Lionsgate bought Summit, well before um, the Twilight series, and they were they were at that time a, a foreign sales and distribution company where they would take independent films or other people's movies and sell them to foreign territories for a fee. Okay. Um, and we had uh, a story department there where people would submit scripts and submit movies and we would send those scripts off to coverage readers, right? And for those who aren't familiar with coverage, it's essentially a book report. You know, you get a script and you send it off to someone, you pay them $50 at least at the time, maybe they'd make more now. And they do a little short synopsis of what that script is and give you comments on what it is. One of the coverage readers that I had working for me at the time uh, was a young aspiring filmmaker who had written a script himself that had gotten passed on, that no one around town wanted to do it. And along with uh, this gentleman named Aaron Ryder at, at uh, another company that was financing films, we decided that the script that he had written was one of the greatest things we'd ever read 
and it was called Memento. And that filmmaker was Chris Nolan. And he was my coverage reader. He was getting $50 a script. Um, so I always thought from that moment in time, and I did not produce that movie. I don't take credit at all for making the movie. All I take credit for is reading it and recognizing that there's some serious, serious talent here and getting my company involved in making that movie. Um, so yeah, he'd be someone I'd love to make a movie with because that would be a great full circle from 25 years ago. <laughs> Come full circle. So, so you're not involved in Tenet is what you're saying. You're not I'm like... <laughs> no, no for you, no for you. I'm really excited to watch that movie. Yeah, if it comes out, we're we're waiting for the the push back because of all this. So me, we were talking about like how that second half of the year is just going to be like so bold, like so robust because everyone's just going to release their movies at that time. Because I know, I know. Yeah. There's be a lot of content. Well, yeah, uh, but the Academy announced that they're going to um, uh, loosen the the rules. I think this year on eligibility with VODs and stuff like that because some movies have to move to VOD, right. um, which is going to be good to see because I think, and, that, and uh, you know, the Academy has its own problems with really uh, stretching out their palettes, so to speak. But I think this will help some uh, additional exposure. We might get some more eclectic nominees this year. Um, right. So actually, uh, I have an interesting question for you in light of that. And I think you kind of already answered a little bit with Memento, but is there something that kind of passed your desk that you passed on that got made and you now regret? Um, you, didn't, you didn't get to it. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure the answer is yes. Um, but there's one. Titanic? No, is that, is that, no, not that one. Yeah, I, no. I can tell you a story about one that I tried to pass on. Um, okay. Okay. And this, but this is also an interesting point because, you know, going back to the beginning when you asked me what a producer does and, and my answer is you have to kind of love what you're doing. Yeah. It took me a while, but I also realized that my particular, my, my taste, like what I believe I like and what I believe I'm, I'm decent at corralling to kind of put to others to potentially like is specific, you know, even though we do have a wide range of kinds of films on our IMDb page, um, it doesn't mean that those. It doesn't mean that we can that that we're that we're the best at making all films, right? So my, my taste has has kind of honed into what I feel like I can do best. So this story, I think, highlights why this particular genre is not one that uh, pursue all that much. Um, I went to the Sundance when the Blair Witch uh, Blair Witch Project um, started. So we're in 1998 right now, yeah. time for time period purposes for everyone. Okay, I was I was still at Summit, and um, we went to the first screening of the Blair Witch Project, and no distribution yet. Obviously, it hadn't been picked up by anyone. It hadn't been seen, it hadn't been seen by anybody. This was the first screening, basically, where you know anyone can kind of go out there and 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 see if it's worth buying. Yeah, and I'm I'm sorry. Just one question for context for the readers and the watchers. Uh, cause I remember the marketing at the time, like with the website acting like it was real. Was that happening yet? Or this is just first screening. No one's heard of this. This is just something new. First screening. No one's heard of this brand new. Okay. Yeah. We're going to a movie. Okay. Go ahead. Ready. Um, so summit, the company I was working with had, they, they were doing the foreign sales for a company at the, at the time called artisan. Huh. Um, so we all went to the screening and there were about, you know, six or seven of us representing the two companies. Okay. And after the screening, we all got in a circle and kind of talked about the movie and we ran around the circle and it was, you know, me and, and you know, one of my summit colleagues and, and the people who ran Artisan. And I said, I don't understand that movie at all. Like, well, there's there's zero value in that. I don't think we should buy that movie. Okay. Um, well, I obviously got outruled because Artisan ended up buying that movie. Then they did that amazing campaign and it became one of the most profitable movies of all time. Yeah. I realized I tried to pass on that movie. Thank goodness it didn't work. Um, but it really showed me that, man, horror is not my genre. That's just yeah. not something that I'm all that good at. Other yeah. people are really good at it and I'm not. So you just thought you don't have an eye for it. Like it's just not something that like speaks to you. Which, which, I, which I think is great to like yeah. to say out loud because I think people assume producers make anything like just keep making yeah. stuff. But if you're not into it, 
it, I think it can show like I'm mean, Blair Witch obviously ended up being success, successful and birthed a slew of crap after from other people. <laughs> 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 I mean, it was like the first found footage movie, right? Yeah, it was. It, it, it gave us paranormal activity and every other thing that came after and before. So, but I, I think it's interesting that we hear this from someone like you, like, just like horror just isn't my thing. You probably won't ever get a horror movie from me. Or if, if, or if, if it happens, probably because I got outruled and I'm just going to be there, but then I'll get it maybe later in terms of like, the idea of it, but I think that's I think that's a good uh, well, that's the benefit of having a business partner too, because we can make yeah. that you know he likes that I don't I like that he doesn't, but you know a, a, a perfect version of my kind of horror movie is one that we did make called Warm Bodies, mm. a zombie love story with a happy ending. That's kind of my kind of horror movie. <laughs> good, it's awesome. Oh man, people love Warm Bodies. I haven't seen Warm Bodies in a really, really long time. I, yeah, uh, Levine, a great film. Yeah. I, I really love that movie. Cool. Awesome. Uh, Nick says, thank you for answering his questions. Uh, we actually have a couple games that we play on the site. Uh, you're, they're, they're not mean, they're me not meant to be mean spirited. So what we do, we, because we're an award site, we talk a lot about, you know, this such, such person deserved the Academy Award. They should have won, blah, blah, blah. And then we, then the internet, quite frankly, bitches and moans about it for the future. <laughs> so we do that. So we have a game called Choose the Gold, right? So we're going to, I'm going to give you a person and I have the IMDb, I have IMDb up to help you out a little bit in case like, you know, you can't think that quick on your feet, but it's supposed to elicit that type of reaction, but it's choose a gold. I'm going to name a person. And then you're going to choose what they should have won an Academy award for up until this point, mm. but knowing that you're going to replace the person who did, you know, win the Academy Award in that spot for that year. So it will be some typing. So I'm, I'll be looking over to the side, but I'm not ignoring you. I'm just helping you move to this as fast as possible. Yeah. And he, we got a lot of questions in uh, not just acting genres, but in uh, it's a composer edition. This is submitted by one of our readers, uh, Ethan. So thanks so much, uh, Ethan, for uh, submitting this. So the first person on the list is Bernard Herman. And one of the great... Uh, Composers responsible for Taxi Driver, Citizen Kane, Vertigo, so many. Um, he did win an Oscar in his lifetime. He won for All That Money Can Buy in 1941, which is not, you know, a good representation of what we love Bernard Herman for. Right. So do you have anything that stands out to you on, on his uh, filmography? Boy, um, I just recently rewatched Taxi Driver. Um, first time in a while? Uh, first time in probably 10 years. Okay. Yeah. And it's just amazing to me how, how that movie holds up and, and the music is so iconic. Yeah. So it's also, uh, for me, everyone like gets mad at me for this. So also, I, and I, Scorsese's probably my favorite director ever. It's also for me, one of the most overrated movies like of like film. Cause I mean, it's, I think it's fine. <laughs> it's fine. I don't think it's bad. I think it's a great Robert De Niro, but I, there's so many other Scorsese's I put, I put, uh, you put it. what's your favorite Scorsese movie? <sighs> so it, it used to be, um, I used to have a really big soft spot for the last temptation of Christ. Right. And, um, and I loved uh, Kundin for a long, long time, but I really, I think, settled on it, one of his most recent ones, which is Silence. I adore Silence so much. It's I've rewatched it multiple times. Again, it's not everyone's cup of tea, and I get that. I will understand it, but it's I, I, it, I, maybe it's because I grew up Catholic too. It just spoke to me heavier than any of his other films, but I was big on it. Uh, obviously a big one from Bernard Herrmann is Psycho from 60. So a lot of people say that should have been his Oscar. So just to give some context of what he would, what won that year, it looks like it was, oh, that year is... That's 60. It's, it's 60, 61, and uh, 60, and we're looking at Exodus that won uh 
the Oscar for the school. Okay. All right. Well, and I'm, and I'm okay doing, yeah. doing that. Stuff, but. Yeah. <laughs> uh, next one is Johnny Greenwood works uh, very often with Paul Thomas Anderson. Yeah. Uh, and I think off the top of my head, I'm going to say there will be blood. That's, I mean, that is, that's another movie that I watched recently and holy moly, does that, does that hold up? It does. It, it's, Aged very, very well. Surprising oh, how, how much it's aged. He's, he was always deemed ineligible, uh, uh, Johnny Greenwood. He usually like can never get a good eligibility thing. And if I'm giving it to Johnny Greenwood, I, that means I'm giving it to him over Dario Marinelli for Atonement, which is hard to do. It's it seems hard, man. It is hard. I love Atonement so much. I love them both. So yeah. I don't know. Uh, We'll give one more for you because uh, and the late great uh, Johan Johansson. Yeah, amazing. Uh, I think I would go Arrival. Another Amy Adams gem. Let me look. Hold on a sec. Uh, or Theory of Everything. Yeah, Arrival. I mean. Uh, on his filmography, before we, before we lost him, we have Sicario, yeah. Theory of Everything, Prisoners. Prisoners is great. Um, some other good stuff here. Yeah, I think Arrival might be the one. Although Sicario is pretty iconic too. Yeah, Sicario is great. Uh, Sicario, that's 2015. I think we are taking it away from. Let me look quickly. I think, come on. Uh, Hateful Eight, Ennio Maricone. Well. Got to do what you got to do, right? You got to do. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it changed the game, man. You know? Yeah, <laughs> yeah awesome. Um, so uh, another uh, perspective, talk, talking now about your, your, your items ahead, and I you talked about many projects. Uh, that you had in the works and and things like that. So I'm going by your IMDb. Uh, that that was here. I want to know if you wanted to talk a little bit about them. So I know you talked about an animated movie, and I wonder if you were talking about Chippendale Rescue Rangers, which is my favorite cartoon from my childhood because I remember the Disney Afternoon, uh, just watching it every afternoon. Is that what you were referring to? No comment. No comment. All right. All right. All right. That's fine. Just want to say it's on his it's on his IMDb and it's directed by Akiva Schaefer, who is one of the great people in the Long Lonely Island and um, one of the most underrated films. Pop star, never stop, never stop. Oh, uh, shout out to my friends Mike and Rachel. I don't know if they're watching right now, but. We went to the Lonely Island concert last summer. They played in New York, and it was one of the great concerts I've ever been to. Oh, good! It's it's listen. They're not for everyone. My wife thinks they're utter nonsense. She hates <laughs> that like I she hates that I will blast like like F. Bin Laden around the house and like have a dance. But if you guys ever saw Pop Star, and it's financially unsuccessful, no one saw it. But I, it's it's a it's a it's a cult classic. And, and he is one of the greatest guys. Oh, we need to, we need to get him on here too. I need to I need to pick his brain about life. Uh, you also have the Hunchback of Notre Dame on your filmography. Uh, that all, I mean, I would assume you're not doing the animated remake of Hunchback <laughs> that we got uh, back in the uh, '90s or 2000s. Uh, it's around that turn. Um, is was that one of the five you were referring to on your docket? Development, no. Um, the, I'll, I can I can tell you the other four. Um, sure. One was a pilot at ABC that we're that we're doing um, uh, with Stephen Williams directing and uh, Marcus Samuelson's producing with us. It's about um, uh, a restaurant in Harlem, and uh, one is the Lionsgate movie that I mentioned um, about music with uh, Zach Levi and Cole Sprouse called Undercover that okay. Steve Pink's directing. These are not on your IMDb, sir. Just want to point that out. We need to get your IMDb updated. Okay. Yeah. Well, 
Well, that's what, the, that's what the readers are for. They can do that because it's all yeah. generated. So, readers, go update the man's IMDb. Call, call, call. If you're listening right now, Cole, put it on, man. Yeah, we need call, it on the IMDb. Great it on there, it doesn't exist. And how can we put it on our Oscar predictions pages? Yeah. If they're not there, and then you miss it. Go ahead. The other one that's gotten a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of ink is uh, the Shrunk. Honey, I Shrunk the Kids that we're doing with uh, Joe Johnston directing again. Uh, Josh Gad and Rick Moranis. <laughs> so I'm, I'm gonna share this because now it's not like kind of like because now that you said it out loud, like I, I I honor off the record conversations. You had told me about this when we had lunch last year, and when I asked about Rick, and that, at that point it hadn't happened yet, and I was like, you got to do it, and yeah. when it finally happened. I was just so happy that yeah. like I couldn't imagine it without him. Yeah, I give credit on that to my business partner, David, who knew him from back in the day when David was at uh, Disney. Mm -hmm. He was he was pretty instrumental in figuring that out. Have you have you met with Rick yet? Have you sat down and spoken with him and met him? Um, in New York, uh, when I saw you, yeah, we, we also saw him. Oh, uh, did you see him right after you, you had lunch with me? I would be really upset if I walked by him out the door and he was like walking into a meeting with you. Uh, no, it's fine. Great. Uh, same hotel. Was it? Oh, <laughs> God. Um, like, I mean, can you can you just share a little bit about like how how big of a feat this is to get Rick out of retirement essentially to to do this? Because you know, if anyone's followed his his story, you know, over the years, and obviously he's like a a big focal point of our childhood eighties and nineties cinema. Um, it was a real big deal to get him out uh, to do this. Yeah, I mean, I, I I can't speak much to his personal life, but yeah. I'd say that it's it's really exciting to have him in this movie. Um, I just watched with my kids the other night. We're, we're doing now a Steve Martin film festival, so we're doing, right, good. We went, you know, The Jerk. We're doing Honey, uh, Father of the Bride, and we just watched Parenthood. And how they how they like Parenthood? It's actually my favorite Steve Martin movie. Great. I mean, it's like that movie. It's such a it's such a good movie. A young walking phoenix for everyone. Walking phoenix. Credited as Leaf Phoenix in that movie. He's, he's Leaf Phoenix at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Rick Moranis is obviously in that movie too. It's just a, it's a real, it's frankly a brilliant movie. Mm, so as is Father the Bride. I emailed Charles Shire um, after watching that movie, and that was a particularly down day for me um, psychologically because we just mm -hmm. got thrashed with all the different, you know, repercussions of the business with COVID. And I emailed Charles and I said, you know, I've, I've always had this theory about stories and, you know, how they uplift and make yeah. them feel better. And I was in a horrible mood. And then my family watched Father the Bride. And I come out of that just feeling a whole lot better. So thank you. Oh, look at that. Um, and then also, like, just talk about the film, uh, on your IMDb page. You have uh, Sinbad and Prince Charming. Anything you want to share about those? Uh, those are ju just development. I mean, not just, just developments. Development. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're just development. They're not just development. They're, yeah, they're, they're, yeah. they're building process you know this this movie undercover that wasn't on the imdb page not unlike some of these other movies it's taken 10 years to get this going so a lot of these movies you know for all aspiring producers out there the reason yeah. i have passion at the beginning is because sometimes you got to stick with these things for years and years and years before they find their way up and you know sometimes yeah, it's, not, it's not as easy as just throwing money down and saying make it it's there's like things that have to come together the variables that have to come together for a movie to get up off its feet are astounding and i always i always think to myself had i known at the end had i known at the beginning everything that i know about what it took to get this movie made yeah that, that would i would i be able to do it again and my answer is always i don't know if i've had the energy but then i've got another one to do it on and then that yeah. repeats itself um I, I had a question. It was just here. Um, when you're looking at uh, kind of the, the future landscape of film um, and kind of your contribution to it, because you're a part of the the historical narrative now, right? Like we're going to look back, you know, we look into decades, right? And we really go through decades. You know, we a lot of best of decade lists are happening. They happened in December. They're still happening now. Um, what's, is there a project and you don't have to tell me what it is. Cause I always know these are really sensitive and special. Is there that, is there that one project that you have in your head that you're like, 
the, the time I'm waiting for the time I'm waiting for my moment. And that's going to be my contribution to the history of film. Do you have that identified yet? No, no. Um, okay. but, but I, I, I was, I was debating whether I could tell this story or not. Um, and I might as well, we're here. So I'm just going to tell story it. time today. I'm loving it. Go ahead. Oh, quick story. Um, and, and this is not to necessarily answer that question of contribution to film, but this is kind of a tangential answer to the idea of what film can contribute to people, whether it be in awards or otherwise or feelings. Um, a couple of years ago, I was having a meeting, long story why, it was basically about state rebates, but I was having a meeting with uh, the, uh, a politician in a very conservative state with very conservative views. Um, now, I try to keep politics out of any of these discussions. I'll say my, my particular views are, are not aligned with this particular politician's views. Okay. And he was asking me about um, Beauty and the Beast. And I don't know if you remember, or any of the, the listeners remember, there was a moment in time at the end of that movie where Josh Gad quickly dances with another man. And there was a whole lot of ink about, you know, the first kind of homosexual moment in, in Disney and, and some of some countries were banning the movie over it even before they had seen it. And this particular politician said to me, um, why, why that moment? Like what, what was, why, why'd you do that? And I, I gave, I gave my answer. Um, and he said, you know, off the record, um, I want to let you know that I loved that movie. I just absolutely loved it, but I could never, I can never tell that to my constituents. And that sat with me for a while. And I said, that's, that's really sad. I'm very sorry to hear that. Thanks for the nice words on it. And look, I hope things change. Um, six months later, I got a call on my cell phone from that very politician. Okay. And he said, I just have to tell you, I was on a plane and I was watching your movie Wonder. And I couldn't stop crying. And just this idea of bullying and the, you know, fighting for what you believe. And, and I just want to tell you that it really affected me. And I remember in our meeting six months ago, when, when you were questioning me on why I couldn't say things about how I actually feel to my constituents. And I just want to let you know that watching wonder, has given me now the ability, and I'm going to now stand up for my own personal beliefs against some of my fellow politicians and go against what my party might believe because I think it's the right thing to do. Now, and this guy was crying. Um, and it, you're talking to him. While I'm talking, I mean, like sobbing. Okay. And, okay. and it, what, it, what it said to me was, you know, look, our country right now, it's obvious that we're divided. There's a lot of different things going on. COVID obviously has, has changed the dynamic. But, and, and it's not to overstate the, the possibility and ability for what stories can do. But if a story can affect someone in a way to potentially affect their behavior, yeah. then, wow, well, we've, we've done something. Yeah fits very much into this narrative that, uh, you know, and I, and I've been obviously very outspoken about it, about like, you know, where so many of, uh, the president's allies feel behind the scenes and how they will talk to reporters and talk to everyone. And it's all like, it's off the record. I think it's, I think it's monstrous what's happening, but it's always off the record and never publicly, which is where we need them to really speak. Yeah. That truth to power. So it's it's interesting that you know even in a small little like what what people may figure as small like film world like Beauty and the Beast having this one moment in which you know insignificant to like the whole sphere of the movie someone has to take this really strong stance publicly but behind the scenes like oh I, I loved it it was great you know and you know it it just kind of feeds into like that kind of anger that we have on a yeah. weekly basis. Uh, uh, last bit before we wrap up, uh, Jen, my friend Jen and Noel just wanted to share three amigos for Steve Martin. Oh yeah, Martin. Good suggestion. That's going to be the next one we watch. Thank you. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's it. I'll take that as uh, advice. Yeah. Um, 
Stephen uh, says, will there will there be follow ups to Wonder based on other books in the series? My daughters absolutely love the film. Such great messages. There's a um, there's a graphic novel that R.J. wrote called White Bird. That's out. It's 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 already published. It's out there, and we have the rights to that book. Um, uh, it's being written right now by one of my favorite writers in the world named Mark Bomback. And oh. we, we intend to make that movie as well. And it's it's kind of an offshoot to the wonder story. All right. Just add to that five, make it six, seven, eight. You know, just, just keep adding to all those. You're going to be busy. You're going to be busy. You're a busy man. Oh. Yeah. Um, so one of, one of the things that uh, as we get ready to to, to, to wrap up here, um, wait, first of all, just quick follow-up to the one, I haven't read the Wonder series. Is it the same character in his other books or uh, just a different kind of thing? So the, the bully character in Wonder, Julian, it goes into a story about him and his grandmother. And it's essentially a story of his grandmother's experience during the Holocaust. Um, he is retelling, retelling to Julian for the purpose of giving him a little insight into being good to people. I'm interested. Yeah, I mean, all right. So it's I get it. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful book. Seems like a tearjerker. I also cried in wonder too. Like I've, I've been, I've been, I've been using this time. My daughter's nine, and my son is five. So I've been using this time to kind of like watch the movies with uh, Sophia. Uh, yeah. She's nine year old and, you know, showing her the first time stuff. Um, and we watched uh, Titanic for the first time, and she, she liked it. Yeah, um, which I which, which I which I was surprised by. Uh, before that, though, we tried showing her. She had been begging us to watch William Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, the '96 version. Oh wow, DiCaprio. Yeah. Five minutes in, she was like, "Nah, nope, I can't." She didn't understand it. Now we were telling her that, but you know, kids think they always know better than yes. us. Um, going uh, one of the fun questions back in the day. If you were a producer back in the 50s, 60s, any decade, what classic filmmaker would you have wanted to get on one of your films that you would have been like, would have been great while they were still here, that they're not with us anymore, obviously, or a director too? Frank Capra. Hmm. Nice. I, I, I don't know why it was, I had in my head, I, I was like answering your own question. I was like, I feel like you would have done great with Paul Newman. Like, Paul Newman was great. Uh, um, Wilder. Uh, but you know, when I think of if if I could have made "It's a Wonderful Life," mm. that would be I'd call it a day. I'd say, you know "What? I'm never. That's it. I'm done. I, I can never beat that movie." So, is that your quintessential Jimmy Stewart? Is that like Jimmy Stewart to you when you think of Jimmy Stewart? That is, yeah. yeah. I, I and I said to my family the other day as we're watching, you know, Father of the Bride and Parenthood, and I'm like, you know, I just. For better or worse, I just very much respond to movies that are sentimental, yeah. that make you, you know, feel. I just do. Um, I love movies that make you laugh and make you feel, and those two things together. And and um, it's a wonderful life to me. Kind of as a, you know, may, maybe not the coolest film reference that one could say, but um, mm -hmm. it's a bullseye. Uh before we let you go, I just have to share uh, something that someone pointed out on Twitter and I have to like share it with you. So there's these uh, kind of gifs that have been happening on on Twitter. Like share one of your uh, uh, clip, like a gif from your favorite, uh, one of your favorite movies yeah. and see if people can guess it. So uh, one reader sh shared one and it's like, I don't think anyone's gonna be able to, to get this. And it was a floppy disk going into a computer and I recognized it immediately. I was like, that's the net. With Sandra Bullock, uh, yeah, yeah, and then they were like, "Yes," and I was like, "I know Sandra Bullock's hands anywhere because she is bringing it to a friend's reference. She's in my laminated five. She's always been number one in my laminated five, and you've worked with her on the proposal. So I wanted to know, does she know how much I love her based on <laughs> like my knowledge of her and just how much? Hold on. Yeah, text her just say Clayton Davis loves you, and if you can get on to one of his." I, actually, I wouldn't be the one to conduct it because I couldn't do it. I would have to give it to one of my uh, writers, like Karen Peterson. She could be like objective. I don't want to make your make your your, uh, your crush even worse here, but she is quite possibly one of the coolest people alive. 
I mean, I know, I know that though. Yeah, she's the best. We had the greatest time working on the proposal. Her, Ryan Reynolds, and Fletcher directing Betty White was a absolute blast. Maybe the most fun I've ever had working on a movie. You gonna work with them again? You think? Oh, yeah, I'm trying. I'm trying. I mean, Ryan and I text quite a bit, trying to figure out a movie to work on. Sandy, the same. We're trying to figure out a one for all of us to work on together. They, they're not only professional. Um, and and wildly talented, but just extraordinarily cool and fun good, people. Good people, like that, and that's what like good people. That's like it's always a big thing. Yeah. All right. Um. So quickly, where can, where can they follow you to keep up with you know Todd Lieberman and all his crazy antics? Oh my gosh, that's a good question. I think it's just at Todd Lieberman. I think I think I signed on to Twitter and Instagram so long ago that I think I got my name. <laughs> I, which is a big deal. Like I, I, I can't. I couldn't even get Clayton Davis for my personal. I had yeah. to do Clayton Davis underscore junior. I am a junior, but I yeah. don't use it professionally ever like that. But yeah, that's it's a big thing to get. I, I have a writer. His name's Alan French, and I think he has the best name ever. Yeah. And he can't get it because there's some yeah. other guy that has it, and we're trying to like bully him off of Twitter. So, yeah, I signed on to Twitter when it first started, really to kind of gauge, like poor man's process of gauging the interest in a movie. I would say, I would see how many tweets were coming out per minute on any particular movie. And I would yeah. do box office guessing on that. What ah. were anyways, Clayton, I love your site. I love what you write. Um, you're, you're a great guy and really insightful. And I'm, I'm thrilled to uh, have a relationship with you and I'm thrilled to be a part of this. Ah, no, listen, thank you for coming on. We love you here. We're looking forward to all the projects you have coming up. I'm particularly excited for Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and so many other things you're doing. But thank you for joining us. Thanks to all our viewers and readers for listening and uh, social distancing. Stay at the move, you know, watch movies, but stay at home and we'll get through this.